pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement. Welcome to another Greatest Hits Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show, this time all the way back from 2019. I'm Griffin the Intern, but you can just call me the Fintern. Remember 2019? We were younger and fully unaware that there was a pandemic right around the corner. Ah, the good old days. Well, today we'll help you get wiser, because Bola Shakunbi joins us from Clever Girl Finance. She discussed how to make sure you take control of your finances by not being left out in the first place. As I mentioned, this episode originally aired in 2019, so ignore any mentions of current events. Enjoy Fintern Out. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and happy National Chicken Wing Day. On a day as serious as this, we are not clucking around, folks. Today, we welcome the author of Clever Girl Finance, Bola Sokunbi. Plus, we're not winging our headline segment either. There's a new scam hitting offices everywhere, and here to explain, we welcome, from the Detroit Free Press, Susan Tompor. That's not all. We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, answer a letter from the mailbag, and add in an extra crispy little morsel called My Incredible Trivia. And now, two guys who can still throw down some chicken wings like they're 22, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I'm all about chicken wings, but like I'm 22? Probably not. I've graduated to the boneless. Oh, what a wimp. We're just easier. How? It's just so... And then I cut them in half with my plastic knife. Not that great. Have you seen the story, by the way? Talk about unintentional headline. You see, you know, the chain that owns Arby's bought Buffalo Wild Wings. And the reason they yeah. want you to go boneless is because there is a shortage on wings. <laughs> like there's, Yeah. There's, there's not enough chickens. There's not, not enough. enough baby chickens. Yeah, so what you're eating, by the way resembles a wing but has nothing yeah, to do what with part wing. of the chicken is the mcnugget <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I i we can neither confirm nor deny that that's a chicken my favorite is getting chicken at the store and it says with rib meat <laughs> like what, what huh what oh well if you want to do chicken the old-fashioned way it might be a little more expensive than it used to be but we got bullis the here with us She's got an amazing story, grew up in Europe, moved to Nigeria, then went to school in the United States, family made a lot of sacrifices. We're going to talk about her story. Pretty inspirational, OG. Far more inspirational than sitting across the table from you. Just saying. Not true. We also have uh, Susan Tompor from the Detroit Free Press with us mm-hmm. on today's show. So All right. I think we should get this thing cranking. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline today comes to us from USA Today. You know how we and about every other podcast I listen to extolling the virtues of index funds. Well, this piece written by Russ Wiles from Arizona Republic, but it appears in USA Today. Your portfolio, OG, is probably heavy on index funds. Now may be the time to make changes. Say what? That might be (laughs) clickbait. Okay. Yeah. For everybody, let's see uh, what Russ here has to say. Ten years into the stock market rally, it's wise to be vigilant for signs of overheating. Uh, okay. Well, market timing, but all right. It's mm, overheating. Probably That's not. A, that, that happened in December or October or I don't know. Last year. Some unspecific some, time. Sometime. While the economy continues to expand and no serious market downturn seems imminent... <laughs> Oh boy. You gotta be careful. It's gonna it's this is too much. But actually, I mean there's not any news to suggest that, but Well, we don't want you to panic. We're gonna hope that you panic enough that you keep reading. It never hurts to be prepared, he says. Research affiliates and investment company in Newport Beach, California recently updated a bubble watch. It started a year ago, an attempt to identify assets that could be seriously overvalued and thus prone to a tumble. Oh Lord. Its list includes Bitcoin, Tesla stock, and many index funds. I get the first two. Why index funds? Of these, index funds are the most relevant possible bubbles for many mainstream investors. 
These funds have become hugely popular in recent years, and they account for a large following in 401k-style retirement plans. If you have money in the stock market, you probably own an index fund somewhere, including through target date retirement funds that own stocks and other assets in mixes that are appropriate for investors of specific ages. Research Affiliates, in its latest report on bubbles, isn't arguing against indexing per se, nor is it calling for a stock market crash, though the company's chairman, Rob Arnott, says he views the market as expensive. Rather, the firm cautions that some index funds, concentrated as they are in large technology stocks, could be vulnerable. The warning's relevant given the persistent growth of index funds, which held 33% of all 401k assets as of 2016, according to a recently released study by the investment company Institute and Brightscope. That was roughly double the percentage of a decade earlier. Some investors who now hold index funds likely didn't during the bear market of 2007-2009, meaning they might not realize how volatile the funds can be in a slide. That is the only worthwhile statement in the entire thing. <laughs> the the only <laughs> take the, the, the <laughs> phrase. The, the very end of that was I agree that the vast majority of people have not experienced a recession with the money that they have now. And that's a funny thing, you know, when you're looking at your money or you're looking at your behavior because that's the only thing that matters in all of this. I mean, intellectually, we can all look at the S&P or pick whatever index, read index or small cap index. And we say, okay, over a hundred years, it's averaged 10% or 12% or 7% or whatever the number is. But to get that, you have to have been invested throughout that entire time period. Now there's an opportunity for you to do better than that. If you happen to get in at the right time and out at the right time, there's also an opportunity for you to do worse than that. And there's a greater likelihood that you're going to do worse than that because of your decision-making along the way. So we know, okay, it's going to average a decent return or has averaged a decent return over nine and a half decades of data. And then the first sense of like something going the opposite way in terms of the economy or the market, people go, ah, oh, I got to get out of this. Like, No, you have to stay to get all of the stuff that you were promised when you bought the thing to begin with. That's the trade off. It's like the first time you have a diet and you feel hungry going, I got to get out of this because I need a cheeseburger. I don't know. Cheeseburgers are pretty good. So might be worth it. <laughs> that was a pretty good cheeseburger at, uh, at the executive retreat a couple weeks ago. Mm, good stuff. Yeah. I, I get frustrated by pieces like this only because the second half of the piece, and by the way, the piece does continue. It goes into how indexing works, which I think is important, right? You go into an investment, you should know these are all stocks. You should know what the volatility of stocks are over time so that you kind of know how bumpy the ride's going to be. And how it's weighted. I mean, different indexes are weighted in different ways. And I think the buried lead here is because of the weighting of the S&P or because of the weighting of technology right now in these indexes, you are exposed to higher technology stocks, a higher weighting of technology stocks in your portfolio than you might think that you are. And with that comes concentration risk and sector risk and more specifically volatility. And people don't necessarily recognize what real volatility feels like. So that is true. But the answer is not to trade out in it. The whole purpose of having a flipping index fund is so you don't trade out of it. Right. Like that's, that's what you're doing when you buy an index fund. And the thing that's cool about indexes too, OG, while they will hold, let's say it's the S&P 500, they will hold the worst companies in the 500. They'll also hold the best ones. And you know what? If companies fail enough that they're no longer in the 500 biggest companies in America, you know what the cool thing is? It fixes itself. So what are you trying, if your goal is to own the 500 biggest companies in America, why are you trying to fix the thing that is self-fixing? Yeah. It's crazy. It's because of these articles. But there's this overheating. Don't I have to do something? No. And in our second headline, don't do your boss any favors by buying them gift cards. It turns out that it's likely a scam. And usually we would walk into the piece like OG and I usually do, but we actually have the woman who wrote it today with us on my dad's shortwave from USA Today and also the Detroit Free Press. It's our friend Susan Tompor. How are you, Susan? Oh, very good, Joe. How's it going? Well, better now that I get to talk to you because you and I used to talk all the time and I feel like I haven't talked to you in forever. 
It has been a long time. It's great to reconnect. It, it really is. Uh, we used to talk quite a bit. Well, let, let's dive in. What's going on with this uh, boss? Uh, this boss gift card scam. This is a hot scam that's going on right now this summer, and it's been ongoing, but it, it does seem to be heating up. You might get an email that looks like it's from your boss, or it could maybe be your minister or pastor. And as the school season heats up here, back to school season, it could even be from the principal of your uh, children's school. And what it'll do is they try to play on you doing a favor. Can you do me a favor? And that favor might be, I'm at a hospital now and I need gift cards to help this person's family. I know that was one that uh, a coworker had even gotten recently from her church. They, some pastor was there and he wanted to help the person who was in the hospital. Uh, another woman that I wrote about, she got a request from her boss saying, can you buy me $500 in gift cards, four or $500 gift cards, and they're going to use that for prizes for employees. Well, she did it because she was new to the company and, you know, she knew her boss was on vacation. It made sense to her. And he kept pressuring her and saying, well, where are we on this? Where are we on this? So in the end, she bought two Best Buy gift cards and two Target gift cards. And she was out $2,000. Oh. Um, it sounds like people would never fall for this. You know, every time I write about these things, people are always saying, who's going to fall for this? Well, people do fall for it because often they're very helpful people. Many times these are authority figures that we're dealing with. It's your boss. It's the pastor of the church that you want to, you know, help out. Everybody wants to seem charitable. Everybody wants to seem to be a good employee. And we're also used to jumping on those emails. Anybody who works in an office setting these days knows that you're supposed to jump on that email the minute you get it. So people do respond rather quickly. And once you respond, the scammers know they've got a live one on the wire and then they may send you something back. Um, the initial mes message is going to be pretty innocuous, like, Joe, can you please email me back? I need a favor. Or, and, well, and just to mm -hmm. be clear, Susan, this looks like it's coming directly from your boss. Like it may even say your boss's email or your minister's email. It's going to look like it's coming from that person. So you trust it. Right. It it may be a Gmail account, though. That might be the only tricky thing. And, and you might not see that. So you really have to look at those a little bit more closely. But yes, it's going to look very legitimate. And they're going to have your boss's name or the minister's name. And then they might say, are you available for the moment? I need you to handle a project. Uh, very busy at the moment. Can't talk. Just send an email. Well, the minute you send an email, that's when they're going to start saying things like, good to hear from you. I need to get three iTunes gift cards for my niece. It's her birthday, but I can't do this right now because I'm traveling. Can you help me out? Any store? I'll pay you back. One of our coworkers here also got an email from a boss that said, I need you to pick up three Home Depot gift cards for our project. Well, that was an easy one because obviously if you uh, work in journalism or you work in the media, <laughs> um, we're, not, we're not building too much. Uh, you know, we're, we're the word factory. We're not the um, uh, factory to build a deck or anything. So we're, we're not uh, getting out Home Depot gift cards for a project here at the Free Press. So uh, that was an easy one. But people do get a little bit tripped up, you know, sure. um, and the wording may sound odd. You know, there's always that thing to be looking forward, uh, looking out for. How does this wording sound? How do you maybe typically refer to that person? Uh, one woman who avoided one of these scams said she worked with a father, Joseph, but then he signed it Pastor Joseph, which seemed odd to her because that's not the terminology they would use in that church. So you, you kind of have to double check. The best bet, of course, is to contact people directly, you know, yeah, call use them. the email that you have for them. That's what mm -hmm. I was thinking, Susan. Just give them a call and uh, and verify via the phone. Right. Verify by the phone. Do you really need this? Is this you? Um, it doesn't sound like it's you or, you know, just say something like that just so you don't fall for this. But people are, again, I'm, I'm telling you, people are falling for this. I heard from a neighbor who said somebody at the school had went out and bought a bunch of gift cards, iTunes gift cards. Uh, fortunately, they didn't hand them over. So they were sort of figuring out who they could sell them to, who actually was going to be able to use those cards. Um, but what they will also do to make you, you know, stop there, stop and think there, if you did end up buying the gift cards, they're going to want you to give the numbers on the back. Oh. And that's how they're able to access this money really quickly. And before you're even thinking, they have the money. So when they're able to get those uh, numbers and the information from the back, they'll have the money. And the consumer watchdogs say the gift cards that are being used are, are all kinds of cards. They're the cards we're buying, Home Depot, Best Buy, Amazon, 
Google Play, iTunes, well, uh, in even this... Sephora, which is kind of weird, um, but that specializes in cosmetics and skincare, and maybe that's an easier thing to sell, you know, on the uh, dark web or, or something for some reason there. I don't know why that would be. You know, obviously with Home Depot or Best Buy, you're dealing with um, some big electronics, big appliances, you know, that sort of thing. Well, Sephora, Susan, I mean, I get that because I think these scammers kind of have a stench so they can smell a little prettier while they're ripping people off. Ah, Joe, that's great. That's absolutely <laughs> true, right? And then, by the way, is there a special place in hell if you're emulating a pastor or a priest to rip people off? It just seems like there's an inner circle of hell for those people. Oh, it should be. You know, I mean, here you're the clergy and also, you know, somebody who's sick. Everybody knows how tough it is with these medical bills. Uh, so you can understand immediately, okay, we'll jump on that. You know, we want to help these people out. Yeah. And then my last, Don't. right, right. My last question here is, is that you have done stories uh, in the past about seniors being ripped off with some scams. And I noticed in this piece, you even have uh, Amy Nofziger from AARP. She's their fraud expert that you quote in the piece. Are you seeing older people more being targeted for these or is it across the board? It's across the board. I think what they're doing is they are able to access our information online. So let's use a church as an example. They might have a membership directory on there. If you're leading a group, your email might be listed. If you're at a school, the teachers' emails might be listed. Uh, if you go look up a school, the who teaches the high school, the teachers, their emails are all listed, and then they've got the name of the principal. Well, there you go. I email the, one of the teachers and say, can you do this favor for me? So there's so much information available online that it could be, you know, people in their 20s and 30s. The one woman who was ripped off, I think she was, I believe, in her early 20s or she mm. was 31. Mm. So it's all across the board. But AARP was the one that pointed out this fraud. They they like to call it a can you do me a favor scam. And that was one that they're noticing on their watch website. Um, and it is definitely out there. As I say, I've seen the emails. I've heard from people. It sounds crazy, but this is what's going on. Well, thanks for doing us a favor today, Susan, and helping us out with this. It, by the way, we're going to link to the story on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com if you're out walking the dog or you're on your commute. Susan, thanks a ton for hanging out with us today for a few minutes. Absolutely. Thank you. Good to talk to you again. You've tried to pull that scam on me before. <laughs> do all the time. Hey, Richie, um, do you think that uh, maybe... We're going to need a couple of gift cards. I keep thinking there might be some big Use party Joe's coming. Use Joe's credit card. <laughs> there might be some big party coming. The bad news about yours is... I can we... see how that would work, though. Oh, I you totally know, like, see it. Should, I mean, how do I not think of these? I mean, not that I would do it. Think about it from the perspective of, like, how to prevent it. <laughs> I get, it gets so disheartening hearing these people getting taken by these. It, yeah. Yeah. The new scam every day, man. New scam all the time. Big thanks to Susan Tompor for stopping and a new by. new podcast every two days. That's right. <laughs> I think that's lesson number one is verify that it's your boss before you answer an email direction that might seem a little off. Email directions, not that great. And then number two is worried about the market overheating? Stick to your asset allocation. You set it up for a reason. I hope you did anyway. And if the reason's better than... I just want to get me more than uh, stick to your guns. Well, there's one person who we've wanted to have on the show for a long, long time. It's this woman. She has a new book out from Wiley Publishing called Clever Girl Finance, and it's our big opportunity to talk to her. Her name's Bola Secundi, and Bola has just a fascinating, fascinating background that we'll talk to her about today. She's a certified financial education instructor, a finance expert. She speaks all over the country. She's been featured everywhere. Time, Money Magazine, you may have seen her on ABC News, Cheddar TV, uh, Chicago Tribune, all over the place. But right now, OG, she's coming down to the basement. Let's say hi to Bola Secundi. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Bola Sukumbi. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm happy you could be here with us. I, I want to start off with a quote from your book. 
that really interested me immediately when I read this. You wrote, and you're talking about women, by the way. We're more likely to talk about things like dating, relationships, sex, shopping, parenting, and reality TV than we are to talk about paying off debt, saving money, or investing. Why is that? It really comes back to our upbringing. If you were to look at the traditional home setting, right, from like our mom generations and our grandmother generations, the money conversations were happening with the guys, right? You know, a lot of times the man was the breadwinner who'd come home, who'd talk about finances with his quote unquote boys. And women didn't necessarily have the conversation about money, not because we didn't want to. It just wasn't part of our culture. You know, mothers pass that down to their daughters. And now we're in this space where we just don't really talk about money because we weren't raised talking about money. And so that's why I made that quote of we're more likely to talk about all these other things, you know, babies, diapering, hair. <laughs> but I want it is to talk about money. But I want to tell you, you know, from a guy's point of view, j- just to let you know how how I feel is that, yeah, we have those discussions. It's always, to me, guys always have the macho discussions, not the important ones. Like we have the, I bought a stock that was this cool. You know what I mean? And and I actually read, it's funny, I've read that women are better financial planners than men are because men are much more likely to position themselves as stock jocks, where mm-hmm. women are much more likely to present themselves as holistic and family-oriented. And so I think even men aren't getting it right on this front. That is very correct. You know, we're not just better financial planners. We're also better investors. And that's because when we have the knowledge, we have the information, we make more informed decisions, calm decisions, where we look at the whole big picture before we do anything with our finances. And that's what helps us be better investors and better money managers. I love the fact, by the way, that early on in the book, you call out the financial industry for not getting this right. Yes. I've had many personal experiences. You know, there was a time I walked into a financial planner's office, which is a still predominantly male, you know, space. Yeah. And he asked me, where did you get this money? Where is your husband? Not not even, by the way, male, but, as you know, predominantly white male. Yes. Yeah. Predominantly white male. Yes. And to me, that was just very offensive because I was single. I had my own money. I had made my own money. I worked really hard for it. And he had the nerve to ask me, where is your husband? Was that the first and question? He said, where did you get this money? Well, he listened to everything I had to say. You know, he nodded his head attentively. And then he asked me, where did you get this money? Where is your husband? Oh, oh. <laughs> So second question. <laughs> oh, did you walk out? Um, I almost slapped him. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, oh, I can't do that. I have to behave, <laughs> be professional. And I was like, you know what? You know, this is my own money. I worked really hard for it. Thank you for your time. I'm going to take my money elsewhere. I see these these seminars that financial companies make for women, and I think a lot of them are written by dudes. Yes, you put some pink on it, and it's finance for women. <laughs> That's so and that that doesn't work like that. Horrible, it just doesn't. Well, well, I want to talk about this because because I love how you present your mom as a role model, and I want to walk through your life. You were born in Vienna. Yes, that is correct. Vienna, Austria. And wow. And in Vienna, I mean, uh, Cheryl and I just got back from Vienna. What a phenomenal place to grow up. Yes, it's my second home, basically. (laughs) But in Vienna, tell me about your experience growing up in Vienna, because it sounds like your dad really was the traditional man of the family as you grew up. Yes. So my dad got an opportunity as a civil servant to take position in Vienna, um, working as a diplomat. My dad was the breadwinner. My mom could not work there. She didn't have a working visa and she was just basically raising her four children. And my dad was also very traditional in the sense that he wanted a stay at home mom, a homemaker, a wife of the home. And so, you know, my mom got married really young. She was 19 years old. My dad was uh, a lot older. He was about 30, 30 plus. While in Vienna, you know, my mom had me. She started to see things that were happening with her friends in Vienna. And even after we moved back to Nigeria that she didn't like, she would see her friends asking husbands for money and getting turned down. You know, she would see friends getting divorced and have no options. She would see friends, unfortunately, lose spouses and no options. And there are many times as a little girl that I would be in the corner of our living room and listen to my mom consoling her friends or having her friends spend the night because they had nowhere to go in an abusive relationship or in a divorce. 
you know, if they had their own money, it would have made all the difference. And so my mom decided that she never wanted to be in that situation. And she decided that even though she had only gotten married with a high school diploma, she was going to go back to college at age 33 or 34 and get her college education so that she could start her own career and start to contribute to our household financially and also start to put money aside for herself. So she was a major role model in my life. Yeah. And one thing that I wanted to ask you about that, how did your dad feel when when your mom said, you know, I'm going to go back to school, I'm going to do these things and uh, begin contributing? To be really honest, and something I don't talk about a lot, is there were a lot of arguments in my house about what my mom wanted to do. My dad was not happy about it. He did not like it. He thought it was a waste of time. But my mom was very adamant. There was actually a time where she packed me and her up, and we moved to New York, Albany, New York, for a year so she could start her first year of college. And she basically left my dad and was like, peace out. (laughs) <laughs> wow. I'm going to do what I have to do. And then eventually they reconciled and started to work things out. But especially in the beginning, my dad just hated it. He hated it so much because it was going against everything that, you know, he knew or he wanted. And it was it was a lot about battles in my house. But she said, this is the way it's going to be. Yep. She's like, this yeah. is what I want to do. And lo and behold, several years later, she was the savior in our family. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Don't spoil it because I got that coming yeah. up. But yes, absolutely. When I got to that point in the book, I was like, oh, hey, somebody, some, wow. Yeah. But, but, but so you moved back to Nigeria, I think. And once yes. again, correct me if I'm wrong. And she becomes this, it sounds like she was already a whirlwind bola, but she was a whirlwind entrepreneur when she got there. Yes, she became the queen of the hustle. So she got her undergraduate degree. She then got two master's degrees. When we moved back, she then started her own businesses while working full time. So she got a job as an investment banker and then proceeded to open a school, um, a hairdressing salon, a bakery, a drinks (laughs) franchise. She was just hustling all over the whole place. My mom would take me everywhere after school. And I was just in some business or the other, you know, listening to conversations about money and product and pricing. And she was just really, 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 really hustling. You know, when I talk to her now, that period of her life was really stemming from the fear that she had seeing what her friends had gone through and never wanting to find herself in that situation where she had no money and she was down and out with four children and nowhere to go. I was going to ask you when you saw her, but she, she literally took you everywhere. Yes. She would like take me to go sit in the bakery, watch them bake some bread. (laughs) I would listen to her on the phone. I was basically her, her handbag. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no longer you, no wonder you liked handbags so much later on, but we'll get to that part of the story coming up. But before we get there, so you almost spoiled this earlier, but thank goodness your mom did all this because your dad then gets this surprise. Yes. So my dad has a health situation that causes him to have to retire 15 years exactly earlier than he had planned. And in the grand scheme of somebody's retirement planning, this is a huge, massive impact, especially when you have college age children, you know, young kids, very expensive. And at that point, you know, I was getting ready to go to college. At the time in Nigeria, we had a lot of economic instability, which meant that there was lots of strikes in the universities. Um, I had cousins that it was taking them seven and eight years to get their college, to get their four-year college degree, just because of what was happening with our economy. And my parents had said, like with my brothers, they would send me abroad for school. When my dad was no longer able to work, the option was no longer on the table. It was not going to happen. Like there was no money to do that. You know, my dad was like, you're going to have to just figure out how to go to school here and it'll take as much time as it takes, unfortunately. And at that time, my mom stepped up and she was like, "Okay, you know what? I've been putting money aside for myself for the long term, but I'm going to give you this privilege that is not your right. This is not anything that I owe you, but I'm going to pay for you to go to college at my expense, at the expense of my retirement, at the expense of our household and everything that we're working so hard for. And your job is to apply for scholarships Your job is to get good grades and come out of college and make us proud. And so my mother paid for my college education while supporting my family because my dad was not working. And it was really, really difficult for her. There was a time, I think, halfway through college where she was like, listen, there is no money. And I had to take a year out of school. 
and then go back a year later to do the last two years to graduate. And so she essentially became our family savior from a financial perspective because she had been putting money aside all those years that she was hustling and doing all those different things, you know, to to make herself financially independent. I, that was such an exciting piece. Well, one thing I wondered about that was you and I, you know, we were money junkies <laughs> and, <laughs> and you read all the time. You read all the time this advice that you should get your own financial security in order first. And if your mom decides to spend this money to put you through school and maybe at the expense of her and your dad, uh, do you agree with that decision? Being in your mom's spot, would you have done that the same way? You know, a lot of that is also very cultural. You know, we come from a space, from a from a place where you take care of your parents, you take care of your children, and your the children take care of their parents. My my parents took care of my grandparents while they were alive. And so I see where my mom is coming from. Based on the question you asked me, absolutely, I will take care of my parents. You know, it's not a question, you know, there's never they're never going to be in a space where, oh, we can't pay our bills or anything like that. Do I agree with it? It really depends. <laughs> Um, the person's individual situation, right? If you're not in a position to take care of yourself, it's hard for you to be able to take care of other people. But at the same time, you know, you can prepare yourself, uh, get educated, get the knowledge you need to be able to create a plan for yourself. At the same time, help your parents or the elderly people in your life create a plan for themselves as well. So um, for me personally, I there is no question about it. I will take care of my parents. Um, for other people, it really depends on your situation, but you can still put plans in place to help support that. And that's specifically right there. Your answer is why I don't like rules of thumb. Yeah, that's why it's called personal finance, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> no, <Personal> really. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, absolutely. You and I have something else in common, which is that when both of us went to college, we got really excited because mine was in the student union. I'm not sure where yours was. There was a table where they were giving out free stuff. If I signed up for a credit card and I totally took advantage of that. And uh, you did too. Absolutely. Mine was at the career fair. I <laughs> went to go look for a job. <laughs> yours was a little bit later then. Yeah, it was in my, so I did my last year of college here. So it was, yeah, it was that career fair. And as soon as you walked into every fair, there were the credit card tables set up right there at the entrance. Hey, because if you so have a, you... because if you have a job, Bola, not to cut you off, excuse me, but if you have a job, you, you, you need a credit card to blow all that cash. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And, you know, for me, I remember specifically the lady telling me it's almost like free money. Oh my! <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, free money. Oh, my God. Where did I sign? And then I call my mom. And my mom, she listens to me talk about, you know, the free money, the free T-shirt, the free pen. And she says to me, so I'm here working and killing myself to pay your tuition. And you are there planning to live life on credit. <laughs> and she shut down the entire conversation. I was like, you know what? Okay, bad idea. And then the next fair, I go back and I tell the lady, I was like, my mom said, this is a terrible idea. You know, she's working really hard to pay for my tuition, young, naive Bola. And she says, your mom never has to know. You live on campus, right? You have a campus address. We'll just sign you up and send your statement right to you. And I just got sucked in. I got my free t-shirt, got my free pen. I was so happy. $2,000 credit limit. I blew it within like the first week or two. I don't know what I bought. Shoes, bags, nonsense. Groceries I could never afford. I bought those. I remember that. Yeah. And then I was in a load of trouble. That is <laughs> so, so, so bad. It's like you were talking to the devil, you know? Yeah. And I didn't come from, you know, growing up in Vienna and in Nigeria, there was nothing like a credit card at the time. You know, everything was cash based. That was a very, my first introduction to American culture in a way. <laughs> well, you talk about this though, in your chapter on budgeting, that if you stay cash based, that you're going to do much better with your budget anyway. Yeah, because you know what you have and you plan according to what you have, not on what you think you can borrow to get you through that month. I collect board games. You collect uh, handbags. <laughs> yes, that is a, a very interesting um, part of my life. <laughs> because you were your mom's handbag, so you had to have very expensive ones, which makes sense in some weird way. Yes. Yeah, so I got to a point where, you know, I had come out of college, I'd paid off that credit card. And I was making 
a lot of money. Well, to me, it was a lot of money. I was making $54,000 before taxes in New York City. (laughs) (laughs) And I had hustled and bustled and basically like gotten to this point where I had saved a lot of money. I had saved over $100,000. I had it in my bank account. I, you know, I felt like, oh my God, I've, I've done something major and I felt like I deserved something. So I went and bought one handbag, which was fine paid for it in cash, you know, didn't really feel guilty about it. I had money in my bank account, but then I just didn't let it stop there. I kind of got into this space where I was like, oh my God, you know, I have all this money. I deserve another handbag, another handbag. Before I knew it, I found myself reducing the amount of money I was saving every month and then buying a new handbag every few months, an expensive handbag that I was not using. The cost per wear was like zero sitting in my closet. It just didn't make any sense. I looked at it like money, moldy money sitting in my closet once I got to the realization of what I was doing. And I I had gotten into the space where I felt comfortable. I was in my comfort zone with money when I knew I could be challenging myself to do better or putting that money to other use. Mm -hmm. And so after a few years, I got my life together. I sold most of those handbags, put the money back into investing. And I do still love handbags, right? That's the one thing I like, like people like cars or like vacations or like fine dining. I like handbags, but in moderation now. That's so fun. It's me and board games. The... uh... (laughs) Not, not quite as expensive. No, 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 no. Well, and I'm going to ask that in a second. But first, I wanted to ask you about this. There must have been some kind of a low point, though, where you got to, you know, most people I talk to, well, and probably you too, Bola, that you talk to, like they get to this point where they're just like, it's got to change. I can't live like this anymore. Do you remember where you were when you said, you know what, I got to change this stuff. I can do much better. It was a combination of two things. The first thing was just having a lot of stuff. It was a lot of handbags and a lot of them were very much the same. The second thing was my then boyfriend at the time, now husband, who was like, girl, these bags are hideous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But they're <laughs> not for him. What who a cares? Waste. Like my husband is so blunt. He was like, what a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's like somebody puts the mirror up. Yeah, but it was it was really the stuff. It was having the excessive amount of stuff that I was not using. Like, I'm okay with, I think, you know, everybody has their own idea of like minimalism or, you know, like what is overconsumption. I feel like if you're using everything that you own and you're getting value and it makes you happy, then it's great for you. But I wasn't using them. They were sitting there looking at me every day and all I could see was stacks of money sitting in the closet. It was stupid to me. Like I was, I just, it made me feel really like, I don't know the word to describe it, but I just wasn't happy with myself. I felt like I was wasting money. It was just turning moldy and turning to ash in my closet. Didn't make sense for me anymore. Well, and to your point, you wrote that uh, on one of your handbags, it was $2,850. And had you put that in Amazon stock, you did the math and you'd now have $35,000. Yes, it's like a dagger in my heart. Oh, my God. <laughs> you just twisted it, Joe. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to twist it back the other way because you, <laughs> you you have taken all of these lessons and made it so that people don't have to walk the same path you did. Uh, uh, you start off with people getting to know themselves, knowing their values, and then you go into uh, getting organized, budgeting, debt and loans. Obviously, we get investing, um, credit, uh, protecting yourself. I mean, it's all here A to Z. And obviously, we can't go through all of those things because I want people to hear your story. But I do want to kind of set them on the path. Can we just talk a little bit about getting organized, Bola? Where do people start When it comes to starting to get there, you know, everybody kind of knows the later things. Okay, I have to invest. I have to save some money. I got to get my credit taken care of. But getting organized is the piece that is difficult, right? For somebody just beginning. Where do we begin? Mm -hmm. Well, it's important to keep in mind that before we talk about the beginning, getting organized is what helps you see the big picture of your finances. It's your big entire view of what you have going on. So you kind of have a direction of where you need to get to or where you want to get to. So when it comes to getting organized, the first thing you want to do is 
find out where everything is. And this may mean blocking off a few hours or a day or a weekend on your calendar and going through all your statements, logging into all your accounts, looking up anything that you signed, especially when it comes to old credit cards, student loans, like, you know, old bank accounts. You want to know everything that you have and what is in them, what what's associated to them, interest rates. You have to be able to see all of this so that you can be able to plan going forward. The, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to to women who have said, oh, I, I have student loans, but I, I don't know how many, or I'm not sure if they're federal or private, yeah. or you know, I have some bank accounts and I found $1,000 in this one place I completely forgot. So you really want to sit down and figure out where everything that is tied to a financial you know, asset or liability that you own, where is everything located? You want to find all those things. It's horrifying to people to actually take all those skeletons out of the closet and look at them, but you feel so great afterwards, Bola. Yeah. You, I mean, it's something that you have to do, right? So I always tell people that, yes, it might be horrifying, might be terrifying to look at all those, you know, negative numbers, big balances, especially if you have a lot of debt. But what you can do is Brew your favorite tea, put on some music, call your best friend, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever can calm you down (laughs) and get it done. Because the sooner you get it done, the sooner you can start to plan how to get out of that situation. You say that cash is queen in the book. In fact, you got one page and it's just the words (laughs) cash is queen. But to get there, to get to that point, a lot of us have to get ourselves out of debt. What's the first step to getting us out of debt? know what all your debt is so that you can create a strategy. You have to know what you owe down to the dollar cent. Know it. Pull those statements, write it all down. Once you've written it all down, then you can start to organize and create a debt repayment strategy. Whether it's paying your debt, whichever path you choose, you need to be able to identify all your debt and how much you owe and to whom, in addition to how much they're charging you for extending you that line of credit. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that when it comes to paying off debt, it's, you know, it's not the principal balance that keeps you stuck in debt. It's the interest that's being compounded in most cases on a daily basis that keeps people in debt because you can never get ahead of that interest um, if you're making minimum payments. So it's having that plan, knowing where everything is, and then strategically attacking your debt based on the plan that you choose, paying more than the minimums, and then you start to see yourself get out of debt. But you have to start by knowing what you owe to whom and what they're charging you for it. The book is called Clever Girl Finance, Ditch Debt, Save Money, and Build Real Wealth. It's uh, it's, it's just such a beautiful book. It is it is so fun, and it's A to Z, and great for somebody, whether you're starting out or you just need a kick in the pants to get moving. It's available everywhere, Bola? Yes, everywhere books are sold on audio and ebook as well. Now, that part is fun, but I know the cool thing is you have to have a tribe of people, right? I mean, to hold you accountable. And I have to ask you, because you're always doing fun things at Creative Girl Finance, your website uh, that was around before the book. Tell me what's going on there, because you always have something that you're up to there. Yeah. So clevergirlfinance.com is our home base. And we're all about making money fun and approachable. You know, our mantra is if you cannot laugh about it, you will cry. (laughs) And I promise you. (laughs) There's a lot to cry about when it comes to money. So we try to make it light and fun. And we have a really awesome social community. We offer online courses and coaching. And we just make, you know, our goal is to make the conversation around money a normal one, an everyday conversation with no shame, no judgment, and just help women build wealth. Yeah, I love that. We don't want to be yelled at about our money. No, or be, or asked where our husbands are. <laughs> <laughs> If you're walking your dog or you're on your commute, we have you covered. We're, we'll link to all of Bola stuff, both the uh, clevergirlfinance.com and the book Clever Girl Finance on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Bola, I'm so glad that we got to hang out with you for a few minutes. Thanks for coming. Thank you. This is awesome. Hey there, trivia fans. Well, we both know the wait is over. I'm finally here. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, ready to save National Chicken Wing Day with my incredible trivia. Woo! Can you feel the heat through the mic? Hey, Joe, what sauce did mom put on these chicken wings? No? No one knows. Must be some ghost pepper mix. I'm dying over here. I'm going to have to do something, but don't worry. We're all about stacking wings today. Woo! 
Oh, man, I need a glass of milk. But first, here's your question. In what city was the buffalo chicken wing invented? I'll have your answer right after I get this heat situation under control. Welcome back, Trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I won't lie and tell you my tongue is in perfect shape after Joe's mom's celebratory sauce, but I'll power through anyways, you know, being the professional that I am. Before the break, I asked you where the buffalo chicken wing was invented. The answer? If you said Buffalo, New York, (laughs) that would have been funny if, that would have been funny. What? What? That's right. You got it's that obvious? Oh, that's lame. Buffalo chicken wings come from Buffalo. Huh. Well, it turns out that on one fateful late night in 1964, Teresa Bellissimo's college-age son and friends, of course, came unannounced to the family restaurant, Frank and Teresa's Anchor Bar, looking for a quick snack to make and in a burst of inspiration, Teresa deep fried some wings and covered them in a special sauce and served them with blue cheese. With wings normally being used for soup at the time, Teresa's invention quickly spread throughout Buffalo and became a staple in the area. And eventually, they even made it to this here basement. Amazing. See ya. Big thanks again to Bola for hanging out with us today in the basement. You know, OG, this I think for me is still a big takeaway that we can't stress enough. You can't have one person in the family who knows everything and the other member of the family who doesn't. The fact that her mom decided, you know what, I am going to get involved and I am going to know how my money works. Obviously, she saved their bacon. It's so easy to fall into kind of familiarity especially in relationships in your family. And I know that's why you stress the, the, you know, the, the weekly family meeting with you and Cheryl so much is that, you know, everybody has a different appetite for this sort of stuff, right? Sometimes people like it. Some people tolerate it. Some people don't care for it at all, but that doesn't absolve you from responsibility. And I think more importantly, you still got to know what's going on. You still got to know. You know, it's funny when it comes to like mowing the lawn, when Cheryl says, hey, I'll go out and mow the lawn, I say, I got this, mostly because I like doing it. But even if you're the person that likes managing the money and you know that your spouse doesn't, saying, I got this is a bad move. Like, don't try to play the hero and do the money thing yourself, because something happens to me, Cheryl knows how to operate the lawnmower. Let's say Cheryl's managing the money for us. Something happens to her, and I didn't go to any meetings with a financial planner. I haven't looked at any of her statements. I don't know where anything is. I got to start from zero at a time when I'm really emotional. That's that you can't say, I got this to your spouse. Got involved. Hey, let's throw out David Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, I love those people. They put what you value first. Right now, I was trying to keep a toddler quiet in the basement. I, I like how she sits here next to us, mm-hmm. K- kind of quietly. Generally quiet. Like like on a scale of 1 to 10, about a 7. <laughs> She's doing good now. Uh, that's number one. What's the other one? Oh, as I was just presented with, Baby Mila. Oh, Baby Mila. Hello, Baby Mila. From American Girl Doll Store. She has teeth marks on her head. Oh, no. Never mind. That's just what's hair supposed to be. That's good. Because I don't want to. It's ask. one of those creepy babies that uh, when you lay it down, its eyes close. You call it Chucky? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm going to go with uh, keeping a toddler quiet and baby Mila right now. Yes. Uh, and it's your loved ones in your time. So there you go. Very much the same thing. Pretty much the same thing. It's, uh, you know, they say in English that things are better if you make them more specific. Like your loved ones in your time is kind of general, but toddler quiet and baby Mila, much more specific. There you go. Yes. Love it. That's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. If you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven life now, you know what? You'll not just only get a free quote, but you will also 
be able to find out how much insurance is the right amount. We were talking to somebody recently here in the basement OG about they might not have enough insurance and encouraging them to go to Haven Life. Uh, yeah, an article or a post somebody had on, uh, on the Facebook page. Yeah, there. asking about uh, whole life insurance mm-hmm. and um, some good conversations over there. But right now, let's have a great conversation with Brooke as we throw out the Haven Lifeline to her. Hi, guys. This is Brooke from South Carolina. I'm calling today with a question about alternatives to my employer's 401k plan. I work for a small startup, less than 25 employees, and my employer has recently decided to discontinue our existing 401k offering for business reasons. It was a fee-riddled plan with no employer match, so I do not perceive this as a big loss. I've been contributing $400 per month or $4,800 per year into this plan, so I'm looking for an alternative for that money. In addition, I'm wondering what to do with the existing money in this 401k and the best option for rolling that to something else. Keep in mind, this is a small account, only about $2,000, as I just started investing in it this year. Here's my current financial picture. I'm 29 years old and debt-free with a fully funded emergency fund of six months of living expenses. I max out my Roth IRA annually, which currently has about $20,000. I also max out an HSA, which I just started this year. My total net worth, including savings and some other smaller investments, is around $50,000. Since listening to your podcast and Afford Anything, I would like to get into index fund investing and feel like this could be a good opportunity to do so. But I also want to be sure there's not another pre-tax account that I should be considering. Thanks so much for taking my question. I won't tell you what size I am because I know Gertrude is good for the code. Say hi to mom. (laughs) Brooke knows the drill there at the end. I also want to say, Brooke... You might not want to do index investing right now because the market might be overheated. There's it's no signs, no yeah, signs imminent, be. but it could be expensive. A lot Psych. of eye roll there, Brooke, just in case you didn't uh, hear the beginning of the show. So what do you think, OG? It's really frustrating that they're uh, canceling their retirement plan. I, I know 401k plans particularly can get very pricey early on because just a lot of startup costs and a lot of different levels of record keeping and that sort of thing that just don't get some economies of scale until you have a decent amount of money in the plan until you have a fair amount of employees overall. But there's other, you know, retirement plan options for employers. So I really wish that they would consider, and maybe you can advocate this, consider some of the other plans like a simple IRA, for example, which doesn't have any annual cost to run. It's pretty easy to take care of. No, no real requirements on terms of paperwork on an annual basis does require a little bit of a company match from time to time. But but even that does, I think, usually more good than harm in terms of, you know, employee retention and that sort of stuff. So maybe kind of put that out there as, as an idea to kind of keep the pre-tax plan stuff going for a while. But if you're not able to pull that off, then really the only place is going to be just a regular investment account since you're already maxing out your Roth. On our Friday FinTech segment, a couple years ago, Brooke, we had uh, David Ramirez from a company called For Us All on. And the whole crux of that company is that too many small businesses are stuck in these high fee 401ks. And they've built a product that's very, very low fee, which is why we shone a spotlight on them. And a lot of people, obviously, your employer doesn't know about them. So uh, you may want to go back and listen to that interview. We'll link to it in our show notes page. And that's David Ramirez, and the company is uh, for us all. I would also add that one of the changes that they're proposing with this SECURE Act that we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show is to allow multi-employer plans, which is an easier way for companies to band together, smaller companies like yours, to band together and kind of offset some of those expensive costs so that there's a little bit more access. So that might be something that's an option too. So hopefully this is just kind of a short-term thing, you know, as a company grows and and maybe they'll come back to it in a little bit. But yep, regular brokerage account for your 400 bucks a month. Also, Brooke, I know a lot of people have side hustles, things they do where they have this, uh, you know, making a little extra money. You may be able to set up a easy retirement plan there as well. If you want to put more money away on a pre-tax basis, say you might be mm-hmm. able to set up a simple or a SEP plan. Those are a couple of options. So I don't know what your work situation is outside of your main employer, but if, you have a, if you've if you got something else you're doing, you might be able to use that to put money away. Thanks for the question. We're also finishing up the bottom of the mailbag here. Richie tells us that we're getting close, OG. Today we have a letter from Brian. 
Brian says, hey, guys, I have a question about backdoor Roth IRA conversions and the pro rata rule. Always my favorite oh, of question. Of course we do. Because <laughs> why wouldn't we? We got to explain what these things are. There is, by the way, the IRS has nothing. If you go to the IRS website, you're not going to find backdoor Roth IRA. What does that really mean, OG, before we get to that? There's an income limit on your contribution for a Roth. Once you or your family makes too much money, you can't put money in a Roth anymore. So to get around that, people put money into a non-deductible IRA. So you don't get a tax deduction for putting the contribution in and then do a conversion of that non-deductible IRA into a Roth. So you're putting money into a Roth, but you're kind of going around the side door, so to speak. It's a, it's a new term I came up with, the side, side door Roth IRA. And then the pro rata rule? Well, this is where it gets a little muddy. So the IRS does not take any advice from taxpayers on which IRAs they want to convert. So if you already have an IRA, let's say that you have an account from an old employer that's now an IRA, it's all pre-tax, and then you do this uh, non-deductible contribution, and let's say your IRA balance is 100000 you put in another five, or I'm sorry, six, I guess, this year for your contribution to convert it. And then you could say, well, I'm going to convert my 6,000. The IRS looks at it and says, you're not converting 6,000. It's all after tax. You're converting 6,000 over 106,000. So like, you know, whatever that is, 5.8% of that is after tax. The rest is pre-tax. So you lose the tax benefits, basically. It doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it a little bit more costly. Yeah. That's the question then. I wanted to define Brian's question before we try to get rid of a little bit of the jargon before we uh, go down this slippery slope. Here we go. Brian says, my wife and I both have defined benefit plans. Those are pensions, pensions. by the way, yeah. through our employers. And we both contribute to employer-sponsored retirement plans, a 403B and a 457. I also have a separate IRA that I rolled over from a previous employer's 401k. Because our current marginal tax rates relatively low, historically speaking, and we're likely to continue to draw income through our pensions, Social Security, and other retirement savings after we stop working, I think it makes sense to start saving into a Roth now. We have Roth options through our employers, but I prefer the tax savings of traditional 403B and 457 contributions. Our income's too high for straight Roth contributions, so I'm considering using what OG referred to as the side door, Roth, or what most people don't call a backdoor Roth. My rollover IRA has about $100,000 in it. I want to avoid the tax hit of the pro rata rule. I prefer not to roll my IRA over into my employer's program because of its limited fund choices and the fees. So my idea is to open a traditional IRA for my wife and after making the maximum contribution each year, convert it to a Roth. She doesn't have any IRAs, only her existing pension employer plans. Am I thinking about my options correctly? And am I right that we avoid the pro rata tax hit if the traditional to Roth conversion is in my wife's name. Thank you. That is correct. He got it. Yep. I don't know why you wouldn't just transfer some of your existing pre-tax holdings into a Roth also. I mean, that if you want to build the Roth, that's the fastest way to, you know, to do that. I mean, I get that you're going to lose some tax benefits, but if you're, if you're uh, worried about future tax liability and that sort of thing, doing $6,000 increments when if you're contributing what sounds like the maximum to a 403B and the maximum to a 457, if that's the only contributions, you're talking about 36, 38, maybe even as high as $50,000 a year if you're over 50 of pre-tax contributions. And you're going to try to, and you've done that for a long time probably. So you have a sizable portfolio and then you're going to try to offset it with six thousand dollar contributions you know for the next 15 years you'll never yeah. catch up yeah you know if you're trying to make a dent in that tax triangle that we talk about you have to kind of jerk the wheel the other direction the trade-off is the tax bill so you have to you have to look at that i would i would look at the marginal rate that you're in and see see where you're at relative to the line yeah relative to the line and, and see if you can't play little tax games for a few years. And what we mean by that is, uh, Brian, right above you is as you're turning this into taxable money, you know, how much money, how far can you go before you end up actually hurting yourself in this particular year? Correct. By the way, Brian and Brooke, both some of our favorite people. So because of that, we give you the thing that we like to say to our favorite people.
I didn't think Brooks was nerdy. If somebody ever yelled that to me on the street, I'd, I'd go high five him. But yes, I am. Yes. Yes, I am. Brooks is nerdy enough. She's she's nerdy nah. enough to call her show. Nah. It was awesome. That's that's not nerdy. Brian was an Uber nerd. I'll give you that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But he doesn't get a shirt, so getting that's down a in the weeds. Yes, Brooke gets the shirt. And she knows the game. So thanks to both uh Brooke and Brian for your questions today. You got a question for the show? It's the Haven Lifeline peeps that you call into. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh we would love to chat about your question on the air just imagine your next day at work and you have your device and you're walking through the hall and you're I'm showing on, all I'm your friends i'm on itunes that you hey guys did you hear me on itunes i was on apple podcast yesterday yeah. i was on spotify check out my playlist it's me oh i'm sorry did i accidentally press play there oh look i'm on it huh i wonder what this could be look i'm famous me. i am famous yes me that's gonna do it for today Thank you so much. We'll let uh, Doug do the thank yous as he usually does. But thanks to everybody for hanging out with us today. We really appreciate the questions. It's always so fun when we head down to the basement to know that both listeners, OG, are really having fun with us. Once we know that everybody's on board, uh, that's good. Right now, mom uh, has on her refrigerator Five-star review from Frankie6868 says, great fun podcast. Joe and OG are really great, but that Doug guy's the one that takes the cake. Literally, I'm pretty sure he takes cake from people. <laughs> yes, he does. Watch out. I've heard if you learn anything, then you get a cake, but Doug takes it. That review, I think, takes the cake, OG. Thanks a ton to Frankie for leaving that for us. Also, and lastly, if you're somebody looking for good financial help in your corner, OG and his team are currently, they got the doors open, they're taking clients. So head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG for a link to their calendar and how they can interface with you to make your financial situation stronger. That's going to do it. Doug, it's all back on you, man. Doug's taking the cake. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe. I got this one. First, take some advice from Bola Sukumbi. And don't let someone else take charge of your financial future. The basics aren't difficult, and with people like Bola teaching, they're also fun. Second, your boss wants you to buy some gift cards? If she's emailing you the request, it might be a scam. Verify via phone or other means that you aren't about to become a victim like uh, the people Susan Tompor from the Detroit Free Press talked about today. You don't want to be one of them. But the big lesson? Don't crack chicken jokes with Joe's mom while she's eating wings. She might get her tail feathers all ruffled up. Get it? Feathers? Chicken day? Yeah, I know. Not my best work. It was a late night at the Sizzler last night, and I might have been overserved. That's what you're getting today, folks. Special thanks to Bola Sukunbi for stopping by the basement. You can find more from Bola and her book, Clever Girl Finance, at her aptly named site, clevergirlfinance.com. Or, you know, through our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. And another big thanks to Susan Tompor for helping us out with the headlines today. You can find her piece in our show notes. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I swear the worst part about coming over to Joe's mom's house is having to put on pants. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens here stays here. And, I, have a, uh, I have a new guest that we have to get on the show. A new author. You sent Doug and I, I think, did, did you send Doug the same thing? Yes. Yeah, he was less than, you know, I don't know. Really? Maybe he was having a rough day yesterday. I thought it was funny. I think it's still funny. I thought it was incredibly funny. So you sent us a copy of a book called? It's called, uh, I Won't Be Coming Into Work Today Because You Are All <laughs> Kids. <laughs> and it is... And it is so funny. And by the way, if I worked with this guy, I would think he's the biggest jerk at work. Written by David Thorne. I think he's Australian. He is a pot stirrer. Yes. It, you led me to one piece of the book where a guy is angry that an, another woman is being paid more than him. And he starts off calm. The guy writes him an email and says, hey, do you know that, that, that Jody, and he calls Jody a really bad name, So do you know Jody's yeah. being paid more than me? And he goes, well, besides the fact that she's been here longer than you, uh, yeah, by far. Has, has more skills. It has more skills. Uh, how would you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. How would you know? Besides that, you're way better and you deserve more. Uh, how would you know? And he's like, well, I was looking at boss's computer and he, when he was like getting coffee and I saw. And he goes back into like, well, ignoring the fact that you shouldn't be doing that. And also ignoring the fact that once again, Jody has more skills and whatever. I think you should you should totally take it to him. You should totally tell the boss what you think. And then he gets into a PowerPoint and then he makes him change the PowerPoint. And he says that you should, you should try different font sizes for you. Versus... <laughs> you should put a cloud background and, and change it to a checklist where it's David on one side, Jody on the other and all the check marks. And he's got these great terms that he starts with, you know, like he's more experienced. He's a faster worker. He has more skills. He's got a software. degree. Yes. He's quicker. He's a lot of knowledge, like just a very resume. -y does thing. he change? Does he change knowledgeable to untenable? What's the one that he tells him? To, you need to change it from this to untenable. Unattended. Unattended. Yes, he can work yes. unattended. He, he can work unattended. And and the author writes back in an, in an email. He goes, no, no, no. You should change it to untenable because they're pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so the guy immediately puts down. You need superfluous information. He's untenable and Jody's not. Yes. That's, that's so good. I love it when people tell you words, by the way, that you don't know the meaning of and uh, you bark those out. Um, <laughs> His last thing is, I wouldn't mess with perfection. I'd say good luck, but you won't need it. <laughs> so this dude he, walks. Like, changes the font and he's got like cloud backgrounds and stuff. He just keeps on like poking them like, ooh, you know, the boss really likes to have. Yeah. You know, what you should do is make Jody's font like a like a comic, comic sans. Comic Sans that like show off her, like, like she's a comp, you know. His is professional, hers is hers is comic. Yeah. So, totally. So Walter is equipped, wisdom, speedy, untenable, and understanding. <laughs> it's like no coherency whatsoever. And that's that's why he deserves more money than Jody. Yes. Who he isn't even supposed to know that uh, Jody makes more money. Yes. And then that little chapter ends on an email copy from, from the boss. From the boss that says, David, can I see you in my office? <laughs> Who's the? Yeah. Yeah. He got caught. Uh, thank you for that book. I've, uh, I looked at that chapter and then we should try to get him on the show because he knows what it's like to work in an office. Apparently he does. There's David, a, David Thorne, T H O R N E. If you want to go pick it up deal. There's a, there's another chapter in the book that I read as well, which was a guy writing him for business cards and wanted his business cards redone and david had worked at this agency but the agency had folded and so the guy had found people at the agency they're like we don't have your files why don't you go ask david for them because he's the one that worked on it and david's like i don't work at that agency anymore why would i have your files i don't have your files the guys <laughs> the guy's like well here's here's kind of the way they looked and he said you know, there was one time my family and I, we were camping alongside this river. We were up on this overlook on this hill, but it was kind of muddy. And I parked my Jeep in the muddy part, woke up the next morning after a big rainstorm. The muddy part had turned into a landslide and my Jeep had gone deep down into the river. So my son and I, we had to get on one of these rafts and we had to float all day down the raft to reach civilization. And so when we got to civilization, 
what I wanted to do was I wanted to go to the car dealer and tell them you owe me a new car. <laughs> and the guy's like, I don't, I, I don't really get the point of your story. He's like, it isn't their fault that I parked my, that I went with this crappy agency that folded. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the agency folded. They're supposed to have your stuff. There's no way I'd have this stuff. I can do it again for you for $75 an hour. It'll take me three hours. And the guy writes back, there's no way in hell I'm paying you again for work that you already did for me. And he said, well, I forgot. The fee's not three times $75. The fee now is $450 for the jumping frog fee. And the guy's like, what the hell's the jumping frog fee? Yep. He's like, well, one time I committed to doing this work for somebody. And just after I finished it, they decided they wanted a jumping frog on every single web page that I had done this whole project for. And I told them that I could do that, but it was going to cost more money. And they said, because you signed a contract with us, you're either going to do it or we're not going to pay you anything. He goes, so now learning my lesson, I put a jumping frog fee <laughs> On all of my contracts with people that I don't want to work with because <laughs> it encourages them to, he tries to keep telling this guy to go away. And the guy keeps coming right. back. He says, I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to have my lawyer call you. My lawyer's going to jump in your face. And he, he writes something back like, boy, there's no better lawsuit than, Hey, the guy that used to work for the firm that had my files won't do these for me again for free. So I'm suing him. He's like, that would be a fantastic case. It's wonderful. He's very witty. And at the end, the guy still asks him to do the job. The right. guy still asks him to do the job. And he sends him a uh, picture of a frog with his middle finger up. Did you read the back of it? No, I just got it last night. I was, I walked in the door at nine 30, very tired, had to finish money with friends, uh, editing. And, uh, so got that done, flipped through it a little bit, sent you the picture that I got it. But then I, I was reading it at breakfast this morning and laughing. It's, I can't wait to get bad. back into it. Yeah. It's not bad. Good stuff. All right. Gotta go.